Lord Jesus, as we sang in that song, that we are desperate for you. We are waiting here for you. But Lord, we, we don't wait passively. We wait actively. We wait for you actively, Lord, as we call out to you. And we say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, and have your way with me. Come, Lord Jesus, and have your way with us as the body of Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, and have your way with those that are lost and don't yet know you. Lord, we pray that, that those that were ministered to yesterday, if they do not know you, that they would know, come to know the love of Jesus, the person of Jesus. And they would then know that they are secure for eternity because of the price that you have paid to ransom them as you have ransomed all Lord, who, have, who believe in you. And we, we thank you for what you have done and what you're going to do. Now, would you, Lord, reveal yourself, reveal more of yourself to us as we gaze upon your word, as we look at the book of Revelation together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're just continuing in our study called Revealed. It's, it's really a, a look at Jesus through the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is the absolute last book of the Bible. There's not, for me, I, mean, I have my tab here at chapter 22, which is the last chapter of Revelation. Just a bunch of commentary after that. It's the absolute last book of the Bible. And it's, it, it, we really spend very little time in it. If you poll the church, you would find that many, many do not spend a lot of time with the book of Revelation for many reasons. For we're intimidated by it. We're scared of it because of the judgments that are, are talked about. Where we've heard some terrible things. We haven't really maybe studied it for ourselves, but but we don't. Many times we say, "Well, what God is going to do, He's going to do." And so, what does it really matter? I want to encourage us to, and that's why we're studying this book. We want to encourage us that we are called as His disciples to study the whole Word of God. Not to pick and choose. The whole counsel of God. And he tells us in the very beginning of Revelation that those who read this book aloud will be blessed. And those who do what it says to do will themselves be blessed. How can you do what it says to do if you don't read it or study it? So it's, it's, that's very simplistic, but we have to... We have to know what it is that he's called us to do. So we're studying it because it's part of the Word of God. But we're also studying it so that we understand. We understand what's coming. And we understand that Jesus called his disciples to know the signs of the times. That we need to know what is happening and, when, and, and what it is that God is doing in the earth. And if we don't look at his prophecy about what is coming, then we, how will we know? And so he's, Jesus is calling us to, to be aware of what's coming. But we also study it because we, we're looking at the judgments, the ultimate judgment of God. And as we look at all of Scripture, we see throughout Scripture, the prophets of, old, of the Old Testament prophesied the end of the story. They prophesied the end, and they prophesied that as good news. And, and there were many judgments that occurred throughout biblical history that we need to know about and we need to understand. I love Daniel because Daniel was studying the book of Jeremiah and he was saying he was in exile for 70 years and he's crying out to God, I don't understand. Jeremiah prophesied hundreds of years before me, Daniel says, and he talks about 70 years for the, the exile period. It's been 70 years since we've gone into exile. God, show me what you're doing. Explain this to me. And he's calling out to God for understanding. How many of you have done that? How many of us have done that when we're looking at the word of God? We don't understand it. Daniel is a great example. When we don't understand what we're reading, we call out to the spirit. And we say, give me understanding. And Daniel was praying and fasting. And that's when the angel Gabriel came and spoke to him. That was honoring, God was honoring him for his humility, but his desire to know, and then gave him 
prophecy that we are looking at even as we look at the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel have to be read together to understand. And so we look, we're looking at the book of Revelation because we want to understand God's story. We want to understand what his prophecies are, what is coming, that we might join him in what he is doing at that time. And, and finally, we want to do it, we, we study it so that we can be obedient, so that we can understand. We might say, you know what, I don't like all those judgment things. I don't like all the stuff, that, the, the bad things that are prophesied that are going to happen to this earth and to the world, so I'm not even going to look at it. And, and I want us to just look at, if we think about that, look at the book of Exodus for just a minute. Can you imagine if, if the Israelites had said, we just want to love God, we just want to be in relationship with Him, I don't really want to hear about the angel of death coming over. I don't really want to hear about the blood that I have to put over my doorpost. That's kind of weird. So, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to love God. Well, we know from the book of Exodus, and we know from what we've read and studied, that it's that blood of the lamb on the doorpost that saved them and saved their family from sure death, from the angel of death. God gives his people and his church instructions for our good and for his glory. So we have to look at the book of Revelation and we have to study it and understand what is it that's coming and what's our role? What role do we have? And as we continue our study, as we look forward, we're going to be looking at also the idea of the rapture. And what I'm encouraging you to do is during this time is to be like the Bereans and say, Pastor, you're saying one thing, but I need to study it for myself. Absolutely. Look at it for yourself. And I'll give you just a little bit of insight. I, I personally do not believe that the church is going to be raptured before the great tribulation. And that might say, whoa, what are you talking about? That just it, that blows my mind. I really want to encourage you to do what I have done personally and studied it. And that's why I've come to believe what I believe, whereas before I was accepting what everybody else was telling me. And I realized, my goodness, I have to study this for myself. That is what I'm challenging each of you to do. So, as we look at Revelation, we're looking at the person of Jesus. We're studying this book so that we can get to know Jesus. And Jesus is revealed in this book like in no other book. And we, we want the whole of Jesus, not just the parts that we find appealing. We want all of Jesus. And so we're looking at chapter 5 right now. We've been in chapter 5 for a, little while, for a few weeks, and we're going to finish chapter 5. But there's so much in chapter 5. It's, as we talked about, it's kind of, I believe it's the pinnacle of Scripture, that all of Scripture points to chapter 5. And, and then the end of the story that comes from 6 to 22. But chapter 5 is everything points to that chapter when Jesus takes the scroll and unleashes in chapter 6 the seals and then, and then we barrel forth to the end of the story. So the title is Worthy is the Lamb. And there are five messages that we, as we look at chapter 5, we see that there are really five themes that, that are communicated to those who really want to know those who have eyes to see and ears to hear what it is that's being communicated in this chapter. And it's the worth and exaltation of Jesus at the end of natural history. And we looked at that, how Jesus is like no other. He alone is worthy to be worshipped. He alone is worthy to take the scroll from the Father's hand and unleash the seals. And, and we also looked at the diversity of Jesus, the person and worth. He's the line of Judah and the lamb that was slain. That his diversity of his nature and character is revealed in this book, in this chapter. And also the good news of the judgment of God is what we looked at last week. We looked at how the God is calling Really, and say judgment begins in the house of God, begins with the church, and, and that we say judgment's a good thing because it's discipline for the church. It's discipline from a loving father, and we want 
to be disciplined. We want our Father to extend His love to us and show us His love for us and that He cares about us and wants to correct us when we're going off in the wrong direction. So we said it's, judgment is a good thing. And judgment is required for there to be justice. Justice without judgment is not justice at all. There has to be judgment. We looked at that last week, and that's what we, we're, that's what we see in chapter 5. This week, we're going to be looking at how the prayers of the saints, our prayers, those who are followers of Jesus, how the prayers of the saints really correlate or lead to the end of the age, how there's the, this correlation between the two, between the prayers that we pray and the ultimate end end of the age. And we'll look at that in just a minute. And also, we're going to be looking at the, the connection between, the relationship between redemption and consummation. Redemption meaning that Jesus died to redeem us, yes. But he died for more than that. He died in order that he would bring about the consummation of all things and complete God's plan for the earth and for all who believe in him. So it's both. It's not just that we might be forgiven and float around heaven with Jesus forever. It's more than that. And so we're going to look at that today. So, but as we do when we're reading this chapter, we're going to read it together. And this time we are going to read it together with no commentary. And it's just so precious because it is worship. It is worship, and you'll see here as we read that, that a new song is sung in heaven when Jesus is deemed worthy and, and takes the scroll from the hand of the Father. And we want to worship right along with them. We serve a living Christ. He's alive, and as we're reading his word, what we're doing, we're exalting him, and we're saying we join with the angels in heaven with the 24 elders, the four living creatures, we join with all of them as we read your word and celebrate you together. So you can read along with me or you can read in your own Bible that you have with you, but Revelation 5, 1 through 14. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep. No more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders 
fell down and worshiped. Can we give Jesus a hand? I think he deserves it. Amen, amen, amen. And so as we just continue to gaze upon the face of Jesus and the person of Jesus by studying this wonderful chapter about our Savior, that we're going to be looking at the fourth and fifth themes or messages of this chapter. And the fourth one is the dynamic relationship of the prayers of the saints and the end of the age. And the fifth is the connection between redemption and consummation of all things. So, for dynamic relationship of the prayers of the saints and the end of the age. How many of you believe that your prayers are heard? How many of you believe that? Otherwise, why would you pray? So, so we, we believe that. And Scripture here tells us exactly that that's absolutely true. In verse 8, And when he had taken the scroll, so Jesus is taking the scroll, uh, and John is watching this, it says, he saw that the four living creatures and, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. So Jesus takes the scroll, and immediately the elders fall down. And what are they holding? It says that they're holding harps. They fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, an instrument, and golden bowls full. Just, just get this picture, there's golden bowls that are full to the brim of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So at the moment that Jesus has taken the scroll, at the same time the, in, the bowls are full, full to capacity with the prayers of the saints. Is there a relationship between these prayers, the prayers of the saints, and the taking of the scroll and releasing its seals, which ultimately results in the final judgments that come upon the earth. Is there a relationship between that? That's the question we're going to answer. The answer is yes, there is. At the time that Jesus takes the scroll, John sees the elders around the throne holding these golden bowls that are full of the prayers of the saints, which he describes as incense. The bowls are full of the prayers of the saints. Enough prayers have been prayed to fill the bowls. The time is now right for Jesus to release the judgment. Is, is it intended for us to read and to see that there is a correlation? And I think as we continue our study of in Revelation, we see that, in fact, it is true throughout Revelation that the prayers of the saints, as they are prayed, as God intends us to pray, that it leads to God acting and bringing judgments on the earth. There is a relationship between our prayers and the judgment on the earth. We pray, God judges. We just need to look at chapter 8, as we will look at later. But I just wanted to read this to you. It says, There's, this is chapter 8. And another angel came and stood at the altar with the golden censer. And he was giving much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God. So the prayers of the saints are rising before the Lord in this the altar that is there before the Lord from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth, and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. The prayers of the saints that are offered by the angel to the Lord as incense then lead to actions being taken upon the earth. There is a connection between our prayers and what actually happens on the earth. We see, when we ask ourselves, well, what kind of prayer should we be praying? We're informed with, by looking at Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. 
and for the witness they had borne. These were martyrs. They had died because of their belief and love for Jesus. And these who were under the altar there in the throne room, they're crying out with a loud voice, O Sovereign Lord. So they're praying. They're crying out, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? What kind of prayers are these? These are how long prayers. How long until you fulfill your plan to make all things right? How long until you return? How long until you bring your final judgment? Those prayers are filling up the bowls in heaven and setting in motion the releasing of the judgments of God on the earth. There is a relationship between the intercession of the saints, the prayers of the saints, the proclamations of the saints, the incense of the saints that leads to a stirring in heaven and breaks out on earth. These are not just prayers for a good and healthy life or, or that we, our lives, would be made happy, that we would have happy lives on earth. The kinds of prayers are how long prayers. They're prayers that they're, they're crying out to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I want what you want. I want your plan to be ultimately accomplished. I want what you died for. You died that, that you would be able to take the scroll and unleash the seals and bring the consummation of the age. You died to do away with evil. You died to do away with sin. You died for all of these things. And these, this is what I, as a follower of Christ, is praying for. The prayers of the saints trigger judgment events on the earth. We pray, God judges. We pray, God executes judgments on the earth. We don't, we don't, typically connect our prayer with judgment. When the prayers of the saints arise, they fill bowls, and those bowls being filled trigger the judgment events. And we already talked about this last week, that judgment is a good thing. This is what God is doing and what he intended to do from the very beginning. These prayers are rooted in a how long cry. The intercession and the prayers of the saints, I believe, are now beginning to unify around the world in the Maranatha cry, which is, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And that is the, that's what is happening. The Spirit is doing around the world right now. And we're seeing this. We're coming together as believers, and we're saying there's more to life. There's more to following Jesus than a good life. And we in the West, that's kind of so often how we equate our Christianity. It's all about my good life now. And what is God going to do for me that I might be happy and well and pleased? Whereas in the developing world, it's so different. They're suffering all the time. They're suffering for Jesus. They, they understand that the, 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 the Christian life is a crucified life. It's a life of suffering. And they're crying to Jesus, come, come. We, need, we want you. We don't just want a good life. We want you. And we see so often that, 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 that in the West, when we, when we exalt entertainment, we exalt pleasure, we exalt all the good things because they're so easily available to us that that often leads us away from the Lord, not closer to Him. So the question is, do we want Jesus? Or do we just want what Jesus provides? I mean, as a parent, how many of you have adult children? Most of us here <laughs> uh, have adult children. And, and the question is, do our children want us? Or do they, do they want what, what we can provide? And I can tell you, ashamedly, that when I was in college and I was just running, living my life, I really didn't want my parents. I just wanted them to pay for everything. Pay for college, pay for the, oh yeah, call them up, hey, I need some more money, can you put some money in my account? Hey, you wanna come over for dinner? No, not really. I just want what you're giving, what, you, what I need. Give me what I need. I really don't want you. I just want what you're offering me. And I know that's a harsh, can be a harsh word, but the question is, do we want Jesus and what Jesus brings when he comes? 
Because without the judgments, we will not have Jesus. That is the end of the story. And so when we say Maranatha, we're saying, come Lord Jesus, bring your final judgment. Bring justice. Do away with evil. Restore the world and accomplish your final purposes for the earth. That's the Maranatha cry. That's come Lord Jesus. And as we look at the book of Revelation, and you might, as you read it you're, and we study it, you're going to say, wow, this reminds me of, of a book I read kind of in the Old Testament. There's lots of things here, like plagues and things, that, that remind me of Exodus. It reminds me of when the Israelites left Egypt and all the plagues and things that happened. Yes, it should. And at that time, what, did we, what, what, what happened when Moses was called by God to go and to lead the people out of Egypt. We look and we read in Exodus that the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God heard the cries of his people crying out to him. And he said, I've heard their cries. In the same way, he wants us to be crying out to him. That he would come and do his final work on the earth. That, he would, that his plan for the earth, that the Great Commission would be completed. And that we would participate in that. Because we want him more than we want anything else. And we want his plan to be fulfilled. And if you're like me, intellectually, you might agree with that. But emotionally and, and feeling, your feeling is like, uh, I don't know that I want that. I just want things back to normal. I just want my life the way it was. Do I really want what he's calling us to pray for and to, to participate in and bringing about the end of the age? How long until you relieve suffering once and for all, Lord? These are how long prayers. How long until, until I am obedient to you 100% of the time? How long until I don't have to be tempted anymore and be struggling against sin in my life? How long until you actually bring justice to this world? That prayer that he's calling for the church He's saying, will you pray those prayers? Will you fill up the bowls with incense to me? Because as you pray and you join me in this Maranatha cry, come Lord Jesus, then I will bring about the end of the age. It's sharing the, the gospel with every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, but it's also praying along with him that this would be fulfilled in our lifetime. That it would be fulfilled. We want every generation should be praying that. Come, Lord Jesus, fulfill your plan in my lifetime. I want to see you come again. I want to participate in that. And we can through our prayers. As we look at Revelation 22, this is now the end of the story. This is fast forward now to the end. All the judgments have been released. And we're at the end of the story in this is verses 16, 17, and 20. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's a prayer. Come. And let the one who hears say, come. Come. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen, John writes, come Lord Jesus. Those prayers are the prayers that we should be praying, come Lord Jesus. And you know what happens when you pray those prayers? You start asking yourself, am I ready? Am I ready? Am I ready for his coming? Well, I need more time. I, I, I'm not ready. I, well, get ready. Get ready. You're praying this, and so he wants you to pray this 
so that we ourselves will then look at ourselves and say, what do I have to do to prepare for your coming? If I'm praying for your coming, I better get ready for it because I believe my prayers are heard and, and answered. And, and he tells us here, we're to make, this, is the, this is what Maranatha means. It means to pray, come, Lord Jesus. And that's the, the connection as we see it between the prayers of the saints and the, and the end of the age. The prayers of the saints and, and the judgments of God. The fifth and final theme or message that we were looking at is the connection between redemption and consummation. If we look at verse, uh, verses 9 and 10, worthy are you to take the scrolls, what they're saying about Jesus, and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you did what? You ransomed, you bought people for God. You paid the price for them. You bought people for God by your blood, and we all know that. That's what he did when he did that on the cross. From every tribe and language and people and nation. Okay, that's the end of, that's okay, that's the Great Commission. The Great Commission has been fulfilled. Every tribe, nation, people, and language have heard the gospel and been ransomed, that are going to be ransomed. But it doesn't end there. He says, it says, and you're worthy because you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they, those that have been ransomed, you and I, shall reign. Where? shall reign on the earth, shall reign on the earth. So what is the relationship between redemption and the consummation of, of all things? Did Jesus' dying do more than forgive us and justify us? The answer is absolutely yes. He died to ransom us, to buy us. Yes, he did, to forgive us. But not so that we could float around in heaven forever. In glory, but that we would reign with him. Where? On the renewed and restored earth, the new earth. Not in heaven, but on earth. That's why he died for you and for me. To buy us that we might reign and rule with God. That God would dwell with us on the earth. And that we together would dwell with him and reign and rule on the new earth. The judgments of God lead to the splitting of the skies and Jesus coming back on the clouds and the establishment of his kingdom in Jerusalem. His physical kingdom in the physical new Jerusalem that will be established here on earth. He is worthy to take the scroll to release the end time judgments that we shall reign and rule on the earth because you bled, you redeemed people, and we will reign on the earth with you, Jesus. If we die before or during the great tribulation, we will not stay there forever, but we will return to the earth to reign with Jesus. How many of you knew that? That we would come and we would actually be brought back to the earth with him and reign on the earth with him, a new, a new earth. And... We would sit on thrones and reign as he has called us to rule this earth. This is the reason for the cross and the resurrection. The reason why he saved us, why he redeemed us. He, brought, he bought us so that we would reign on the earth with him. This is the reality for which we are living. As we look at Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, we see what his ultimate goal is. It's to reign and rule on this earth. Then the seventh angel blew the trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the world as it currently is, has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Remember when the disciples were asking about what are they going to get because they've given up everything? What did Jesus say to them in Matthew? Then Peter said in See what we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, in the new earth, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. On the new earth. In Acts chapter 3, we read, Repent therefore. Peter is, is, is calling He's calling the Jews to repent. 
He's calling them to repent for having sacrificed their Messiah. And he says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. Jesus, whom heaven must receive until when? Until the time for restoring all things. Jesus will remain in heaven until the time for the restoring of all things when he will come and reign and rule with us from Jerusalem on the earth. This is about which God spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets long ago. This is what it's all about. When he comes, he will restore all things. He will make a new heaven and a new earth by restoring everything that has been corrupted, defiled and broken from sin, depravity and rebellion. Jesus is coming to put the rebellion down once and for all for us to be with the Father and to reign and rule with him as he intended from the beginning. That's what our soul should be longing for and crying for is that he would come back and establish his actual theocratic government on the earth in which we will join him to reign and rule. That's what we should be longing for. Not praying that our earth will be just better, that we somehow would be better. That is not the, that's not the purpose for which he died. And so we have, to, we have to understand the good news of Revelation and the good news of his promises. The taking of the scroll and the tearing of the seals sets in motion the judgments of God that lead to the splitting of the skies and the establishment of his kingdom in Jerusalem. And that, brothers and sisters, requires us to wrestle with the implications when we think about this, the implications of an earthly reign, not just of Messiah, but you and I. What does that mean for me right now? What must I be doing to prepare for that? What is he calling me to? There is indeed the gospel. The gospel is about, yes, our personal redemption, but for a purpose, that we would be bought so that we could reign and rule, so that we can dwell with God on the earth, on the new earth, the new earth that will be, that will be made pure and purified by the fire that will come. It's like this Holy Spirit that purifies us and cleanses us. We'll do the same thing to the earth. We were, regen we were born again and regenerated by the Holy Spirit working in us. That's exactly what he wants to do with the earth. And for us to dwell on that earth. So that's, that's the last message of chapter 5. We looked at the worth and exaltation of Jesus at the end of natural history. His diversity in his character. The good news of the judgment of God. The prayers of the saints and the end of the age and how our prayers are significant. And the relationship in the gospel of redemption and bringing about the consummation of the end of all things. And then, now the rest of the story. So we look at chapter 6 next time. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. Just declared his worthiness. Just declared that this is the most wonderful thing that he will ever do. And then we read about it. We read about it. If we don't know the reason for these things, and we will not understand them as we read them. We don't understand their place. We don't understand it. But now if we see really what his, the purpose, Jesus' purpose, we can read and put that, each of the judgments in context. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus bringing us to yourself. I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him, you could look at, as we, especially as we look at the judgments that are coming, that you will say, wow, that is scary. Yeah, it is. Even for those who know him, we'll look at it and say, wow, this is, this is a scary thing. It's like the thunder and the lightning and everything else. I mean, you might be safe, but you're still 
in fear and, and awe of what you are experiencing. But if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, the, the plan the, for, for your ultimate reality, the ultimate end, really is judgment for your sin that has not been paid for. You remain a prisoner of the devil, and you will then die in your sin and join the devil for eternity in the lake of fire. That is a hard thing to say, and the church does not like to say it. But it is all over Revelation. Jesus said it. How can we ignore what Jesus has said? If you don't know Jesus, if you say, I, I, I don't care that you died for me. I don't need you. Then you will die in your sin and you will forever be in torment in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says. Just read chapter 6 to 22 for yourselves. I want to encourage you. Is there anybody here who says, I need to know Jesus. I need to be saved. I need to accept his death and resurrection for me that I might be secure with him forever and protected and loved, cared for. And then I will one day reign and rule with him. That's the plan. It's always been the plan. Anybody here would say yes. Anybody online, if you're watching and you're saying, that, that's me, I need to pray and receive the sacrifice for my sin. Let us know. We'll pray with you. As we worship, and I'm going to call the worship team forward, as we're worshiping and we're glorifying him right now, and you're feeling convicted, and you say, I just need to, someone to pray with, please, our prayer partners in the back after the service will be there to pray with you. And if you receive Jesus today, let us know. We'll pray with you and help you along the way. God bless you all. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen.